Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is John Sherman. And um, before we introduce John more extensively, or let him introduce himself more extensively, I'd, I want to make it just a few quick practical announcements. Um, one is that if you're watching this as a video as opposed to listening to the audio, um, someone pointed out to me that I should maybe remind people that these are generally recorded at a higher resolution than the default one in YouTube. So if it says 360 down the bottom of your screen in YouTube, bump it up to 480 or 720p, whichever is the highest, and then you click this little arrow thing that goes in both directions and it zooms it out to full screen. So if you're going to watch the w video, you might as well watch it in high resolution full screen. Um, Second thing is that I have a page on the site uh, called Upcoming Guests, and if you go there, you'll see who's scheduled to be interviewed. And um, I want to invite people to recommend anyone that they would like to see interviewed, uh, because that helps me to determine the pr how to prioritize people. If people get more recommendations, it's like a vote, and I bump them up in the pecking order. Um, and also. Um, there on the upper right hand corner of the site you'll notice there's a donate button, it's obvious what that's for, there's a Facebook uh, thing and it helps if more Facebook likes as they call them makes the site sort of more uh, broader appeal, it comes to more people's attention and then also beneath that there's a little plus one button which is a new thing that Google has introduced that's kind of like uh, the Facebook like thing and um, the more people that click that the more uh, it's like a recommendation to your friends that you like the site and it'll sort of come up more prominently in the search results and so on. So anyway, that's that. So sorry about all that practical stuff, John, but I just wanted to get that out of the way and, um, and enable people to watch this in higher resolution if they can. So again, welcome and thank you for this opportunity. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for this opportunity, Rick. <laughs> Good. Um, I usually like to let guests introduce themselves because they sort of know themselves better than I do. And <laughs> so why don't you give us a quick sketch of you know who you are, both in, you know um, in the ordinary sense and uh, what your sp your spiritual um, odyssey has been. Hmm. That's uh, <laughs> that's quite. <a> <laughs> well, well, it doesn't have to be a quick sketch. The, we can spend plenty of time in the, on it. In the ordinary uh, in the ordinary sense of things, I'm a 68 year old man living in Ojai mm -hmm. with my wife Carla and my cat Switters, happy as a clam. Mm. And uh, uh, I have in my past, I was, well, I don't know. I spent an awful lot of my life stupid. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> Didn't we all? And uh, and did, did some pretty... Um, Things that are not commonplace and that are that are out of the ordinary for people to do in their lives, like oh, I don't know, like trying to overthrow capitalism and uh, robbing banks and and doing uh, property damage to capitalist enterprises and escaping from prison and being in gunfights and getting mm. shot and and uh, ending up on the FBI's ten most wanted list. Were you part of the weatherman or something? No, we were. Uh, I was part of a small group of uh, uh, <laughs> a strange mixture of people who mm -hmm. the group was uh, begun by a friend of mine from a long time ago in my first stint in a federal penitentiary. Ah. And uh, we called ourselves the George Jackson Brigade. Uh -huh. And uh, so anyway, we that was uh, that was then. This is now. Yeah. It's, um God trying to entertain himself in extreme ways through the <laughs> through the person of John Sherman. Um, <laughs> uh, it's interesting that you mentioned all that because I heard you mention on on you know audios that I was listening to that you had been in prison and you mentioned bank robbery. But I, I kind of was thinking to myself, I bet you there was some sort of you know social altruistic you know however warped motivation behind his doing that. I bet you he wasn't just in it to rob banks to get money in his pocket. I bet you he was trying to you know bring down the state or some such thing and sure enough that's what you just said sure enough <laughs> <laughs> yeah. of course, there was a lot of that going on in those days that was uh, a wild time yeah Symbionese Liberation Army and all those things um, okay so you spent 16 years in prison and, and Eight, actually know, 18 eight, 18 okay and um, obviously uh, you know as we just said you there was you know however warped it may have been there was some sort of 
higher motive for your for your doing those things. Um, but when did you actually kind of get an inkling of the the spiritual dimension of things, as opposed to just smashing the political you know system? Well, first of all, I'd like to clarify something. I, I it's it's easy to uh, think of what I was doing as being motivated by some higher motive. Um, well, higher, you know, broad, actually, very broadly defined, you know. Yeah, but actually, no, it was higher in a in. A, I I thought that I was very much persuaded that what I was doing was uh, was necessary, maybe not sufficient, but necessary to uh, do something about the state of the world. Yeah. But that whole um, relationship with the state of the world and my response to it was as it always is entirely in order to save myself uh -huh. in order to do the right thing to find the right thing to be to somehow become the right thing to be so that I would not get swallowed up by well this life really mm. the Beatles song revolution comes to mind yeah you know so it's not it's it's uh it's tempting for me to let slide the idea that I was more highly motivated, but it was just the same kind of, of uh, neurotic, fearful, um, uh, confused, and, and miserable motivation that, that, that drives most of us, no matter how extreme or ordinary our strategies become. Yeah, I mean, I've heard it said that everybody's doing the best they can, and everybody's doing what they think is... You know, the the best it's, thing that can be done. You know, but yeah. obviously it gets very warped. Everybody is doing the best they can. That's very yeah. Uh, so obviously, being in prison must have given you time for reflection. I gave me time. <laughs> yeah, well, there's time for reflection there. There's a lot of things that uh, happen. You know, you have to understand it within the, the first uh, the first time they managed to. Uh, uh, capture me, which was during a bank robbery when I was shot. Mm. I escaped pretty quickly after that, with, I think about six weeks later, mm. and uh, in, a, in a gunfight. Phew. And uh, the second time they managed to get a hold of me and sent me to the penitentiary, I escaped from there a couple months after, maybe six months after I arrived, and that's when I was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted mm. list. I don't want to uh, divert this conversation too much, but how did you manage to escape from a federal penitentiary? I mean, it sounds like well, Shaw kind of, Shawshank I, Redemption or something. It's kind of a funny, uh, uh, kind of a funny story. I was, uh, me and my my one of my co-defendants were tried in a in a quite a large media trial in Seattle uh -huh. for uh, oh I forget how many counts, a whole bunch of counts of different things that taken together would have. Uh, Everyone expected that the sentence would be like tantamount to life, you know, right. enough, enough stacked up consecutive sentence to put me away for good. Mm -hmm. um, during the course of that trial, I had the opportunity to, I, I actually defended myself and I had the opportunity to speak to the jury and, and the outcome was actually much different than people expected. Huh. But I had, during, I had attorney advisors there and during the trial I had a uh, I got a, a young woman from the, who, among the people that I knew on the streets to be appointed as a court appointed uh, assistant I wanted people to, I wanted her to be able to go out and make crime scene drawings and, the, and things of that nature because uh, we never tried to to uh, pretend that we were not guilty of the crimes, right. we we wanted to uh, bring to the jury the reasons that we did those and and so forth and so on. <clears throat> In any event, that woman who was appointed as a court-appointed investigator for the defense, uh, we were married in the in the courthouse uh, after the trial and after the sentencing, and she went to. Uh, Lompoc with me. She went moved to Lompoc, and all the time it was our intention that I would escape from Lompoc. Mm. And uh, we, after some uh, failed uh, investigations into the possibilities, 
uh, I discovered that I could, if I, if I made my eye look sufficiently injured, mm. I could have myself taken down to downtown Lompoc to the ophthalmologist there. Mm -hmm. And after a number of trips there on the, at what was to be the last trip, uh, the, the woman uh, brought a gun to the ophthalmologist's office and put it in the bathroom. And I got the gun and used it to persuade those guards to <laughs> let me go. Amazing. That's how, that's how. How long did it take him to catch you after that? Two and a half years. Wow, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I was working at the time in uh, in Golden, Colorado, mm -hmm. and I was working at uh, Sunstrand, which is a big aerospace company. I have a background in machining, uh -huh. and uh, I actually became involved in a, ex in a very ex extremely dramatic effort to unionize that company and, uh, and to uh, prevent them from running away to Iowa. In those days, running away was going to a right-to-work state, not going to China or right. India. Right? Uh -huh. And uh, I was fired and ended up with a pretty large uh, award by the National Labor Relations Board where I had to go periodically to attend hearings and so forth, which was, of course, in the same building as the FBI. So that's kind of... <laughs> you just couldn't leave well enough uh, alone, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but then they caught me. Uh -huh. And uh, I spent... Uh, then that, that was the last time. I was, went, went ahead and spent uh, another 17 or so years in federal mm -hmm. prisons here and there around the country. And uh, here I am now. So when did you finally get out? In uh, 98. I was sent to the halfway house in spring of 98. Okay, so about 12, 13 years ago. Yeah. And uh, I understand that while in prison, you, you kind of got bitten by the non-duality bug and started reading a lot of books and stuff like that. I did. I actually, you know, I was, uh, as a child, I was brought up by my grandmother. Mm -hmm who was a, uh, a Holy Ghost Pentecostal Christian. Mm. And f from the beginning, my inclination had been uh, pretty consistently towards some religious or spiritual or uh, solution to things, which was somewhat sidetracked when I discovered the magnificent uh, presentation of Marx and Engels and Lenin and so uh -huh. right. But I had always had a, a deep... Uh, a deep sense that the, that like I wasn't smart enough to know even what it is I thought would happen as a result of it, but that there was something in the realm of, of uh, outside of the ordinary experience of life that uh, that was important and that mm -hmm. I wanted to to gain access to mm -hmm. in prison. <clears throat> And I also, in the same, in <clears throat> kind of strangely, in the same vein, I also was very much interested in philosophy, which is a similar uh, uh, approach to the problem of being human, as other spiritual approaches. When I when I was in prison, the the the, the nagging sense that that there was something somewhere to be found that would uh, that would solve the, this strange case of being a human being and the fact that being a human being was so sucky that it just does not work. It is not <laughs> satisfactory when it seems like it promises so much. Yeah, like the saying goes, you know, life sucks, then you die. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and in the course of that, and in the course of, uh, of studying a, some more philosophy and at one point, I actually converted to Roman Catholicism while I was in prison. I was mm -hmm. a, a, a complete. Uh, I was a sucker for anything. Yeah. And what uh, what what attracted me in uh, in Roman Catholicism was the the deep mysticism of the whole thing. There was yeah. there was this mysteriousness to it that isn't present so much in the Protestant uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. And then. I, I suppose you'd like me to tell you how this all came about. This, uh, sure. Uh, 
Go ahead. <clears throat> I've told this story like a gazillion times, and uh, well, a lot of people listening to this won't have heard it. So, in uh, 1994, I was, uh, you know, when you're in the federal prison system, especially if you're a notorious escape risk, such as myself, they move you from prison to prison for the entire time you're there. Ah, so you don't learn the tricks of how to get out of a particular and you don't, one? And you don't get, you know, to have, make contacts and, mm. and establish relationships with the staff and things of that nature. Yeah. So that the longest I stayed in any one prison during that period was three years, and mm. often it was two years. And, uh, in uh, 94, I ended up in uh, Anglewood, Colorado, in a mm. federal prison there. Actually, it's in Littleton. It's called... Anglewood, but it's in Littleton, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And in 94, um, by the time I had, uh, by the time 94 had come around, I had pretty much rid myself of, of the, the uh, interest in spiritual solutions and religious solutions and philosophical solutions and had settled down just to, uh, to, uh, to jail and and uh, and you know to to be comfortable as I could. And were you feeling I, fru frustrated and miserable in there, or had you, were you sort of in the present, just kind of going with it every day? Well, at the, by the time in '94, I was I was happy enough. I yeah. had established. A, I'd become very proficient with computers, mm -hmm. and uh, which you know that was in the early days of computers. Yeah. And uh, and in so doing, I made myself valuable to the, uh, the pe people who ran what's called the facility departments, which are the departments that take care of the maintenance of the institution. You know, the plumbing and the mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. And uh, so I was pretty, I was pretty comfortable. I I was uh, not too unhappy. I was playing tennis a lot, enjoying myself. Hmm. <clears throat> and then one day, this uh, friend of mine, who was uh, and who was taken by the Eastern ancient wisdom teachings himself, there's in prison you find a lot of interest in religion and spiritual teachings. It's a, mm. it's a natural fit for them. Yeah. And uh, he came to me and told me, asked me if I wanted to come and see Gangaji. Uh -huh. Was this, this wasn't Kenny Johnson by any chance, was it? No, it was not. It was, okay. It was, I named Alan. Uh, okay. Uh, who later was transferred and so forth. But anyway, he came to me and asked me if I would like to come and, and see Gangaji. And I had no idea who Gangaji was. I probably couldn't have pronounced it correctly even. And he told me that she was this, uh, this kind of gorgeous, blonde, southern woman with a esoteric teaching from uh, India. And, you know, I mean, what, what could be bad about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I decided I, I said yes I'll go as it happened in the time that uh, I was supposed to go I, I I got a little sick and I decided not to go and just blew the whole thing off but then having been exposed to that I learned that there, the people the, the guy who had invited me to it was part of a Buddhist group uh, who people were coming in from Naropa, which is in Boulder, Colorado, which is right. the institute founded by Trungpa Rinpoche. And they were coming in from Boulder to teach Tibetan Buddhism to prisoners in, in uh, Florence, or in uh, Anglewood. And I started going to see them, and I was really quite uh, I was stunned to find that and you know, like in that in Tibetan Buddhism, when the the lay people are are uh, uh, transmitting the teachings, right? What they basically do is read the teachings, and uh -huh. like the, the twelve steps of conditional arising, and the, this and that and the other thing. And I was shocked and really quite stunned to have the sense that I knew all of that, that mm -hmm. everything they said was extremely familiar to me. It was like, uh, it was like, wow, I knew that. That's, hmm. that's, that makes sense. Now there's some stuff that makes sense. It rings true to me. 
so I became um, uh, quite taken by Tibetan Buddhism, particularly the flavor of Trungpa Rinpoche, which is uh, which is uh, different, a little different from from most. He wasn't as reverent and uh, uh, so forth as most uh, spiritual people are. Is he the one who died of alcoholism or some such thing? Yeah, well, it's hard to say what he died of. There's a lot yeah. of rumors about it. He was but a character yes, anyway. Yes, he was a he was a uh, controversial character. Right. And uh, so I started going to the Buddhists, and they were very taken with me. They thought I was some kind of a previously unsuspected talker or something that they <laughs> found working in this prison. And they brought in a. a Tibetan Lama who gave me refuge in Bodhi Sattva Vals. And I was persuaded. I was pretty much persuaded. I mean, you have to know that until very recently, actually, everything that I was persuaded to, I was persuaded to with a certain um, skepticism, a certain uh, like a, a background of skepticism, a willingness to see that this too was all fraudulent and fake, like everything else was that I had tried. Yeah. But still, I was quite taken, and I was really interested in it, and it drew my interest into other spiritual uh, teachings and their writings and, 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 and so forth. So that Gangaji then returned to the prison in June of 94. The first visit was in September of, of 93, the one that I didn't go to. She returned in June of 94, and by that time I was kind of the guy that took care of the exotic Eastern spiritual types, you know, and the guy, like the guy was who initially invited me to, to uh, meet her. So I was responsible for getting that all together and to, for letting the people, the prisoners know, prisoners who were interested, know of the date and time, and, and then I was responsible for setting up the chapel for her. and meeting her and bringing her in and showing her what the arrangements were and so forth. I had, of course, contact with people throughout the time that I was a Buddhist who were in love with Gangaji. And my, my, my role with them mostly was to tell them that they were crazy, that, 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 well, I don't know what she's up to, but that's not what it's about. It's not, there's nothing for you to do, there's nothing for you to get so forth and so on. This is a serious business and it takes commitment and, and, uh, and long time practice uh, with, with, uh, with conviction and, and commitment. <clears throat> and when Gangaji came, I had a, a, um, a really powerful uh, uh, experience of, of uh, the, the stopping of the, the endless story about things and what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and so forth. Did it you go up on the stage and have a one-on-one -on -one with her like some people do in her things or were you uh, just sitting in the audience? This, no, this is when I met her at the door. Oh, okay, just initially. Yeah. Uh, right, right in that moment. And my initial intention was to show her around and then go play tennis, but that was blown away and I became... Uh, I fell in love with her, and uh, uh, I embarked upon a, a year and a half of uh, deep uh, a deep love of Gangaji and and of the of the teaching that she espouses or espoused then in any event. I do they let you bring in all kinds of books and videos and stuff like that to watch in, the, in prison? Uh, Books can come in, videos and so forth can be watched in the chapel and mm. things of that nature. But I, during that period, I became really uh, quite familiar with the ancient wisdom teachings from India, mm -hmm. all of them. I was, uh, I was hungry for, to understand, to get the, the sense of what all this was about and in ways that now seem a little mysterious books that are, would be unexpected to ever find in a prison environment came to me. And uh, books on Zog Chen, books on uh, the, the Upanishads, books on all, all of that wild stuff. So I became quite well informed and quite uh, uh, 
uh, deeply in, in invested in that particular path. I spent a year of what I have come to call uh, enlightenment, uh, just as a catchphrase, just a, uh, I spent a year of, uh, in a state of, uh, clarity and, and, uh, non-dual consciousness and, and, uh, and, and, and bliss. Yeah, I heard you mention that on one of your recordings. Did, did that just sort of come upon you suddenly one day? Uh? Well, it came upon me, what I thought at the time, it came upon me suddenly in mm -hmm. the moment that I met Angaji. Oh, just that moment. Side okay, one. so from Side. the moment you met her, you were in this sort of non-dual <coughs> bliss, blissful state. Yes, that's right. Okay. And, uh, and she and had, had you been actually, you've been doing a kind of a meditation practice as a part of the Naropa teachers, right? That's you right. were that's Yeah, okay. And uh, the uh, and we started writing to each other, and I wrote her pretty much every day, uh -huh. and she wrote back almost every day. We had a quite a, an intense and energetic and wonderful uh, relationship in that way. That's great. And it went on for a year or so, and then my so-called enlightenment collapsed. Mm -hmm. Just out of the blue, one day you're brushing your teeth or something, and all of a sudden, boom, it's gone. Well, no, not quite like that. It was more the fact that I became, um, I got, it turned out that it wasn't true that there was nothing I wanted. It turned out that that was actually something that I had just made up. Uh -huh. And that was revealed itself when I met a woman who was close to Gangaji, who got on my visitors list, mm -hmm. started coming in to visit me, and we became involved in a romantic relationship. You it, can do that in prison? Well, you can do it anywhere in the, anywhere <laughs> in the world. It's all in the mind, right? Oh, okay. So, yeah, the, 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 the were, hearts kind of woke up there. Yeah, yeah we, we were, uh, you know, we, we visited quite often, you mm -hmm. know, probably at least once a week and talked on the phone mm -hmm. all the time. And she was very close to Gandhi. And, uh, and uh, at one point, she went to Gangaji and told her what had happened. Uh -huh. Now, this woman was married. Oh, I see. <clears throat> and uh, Gangaji became infuriated hmm. and wrote me a letter, you know, that was full of fury and anger. Right. Yeah. And uh, and I, everything just turned to, turned to, rottenness. That's interesting. It caused your whole non-dual thing to just collapse. That's right. Just yeah. So Dr. now... She has had her own share of marital difficulties in yeah, recent she, years. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That's, yeah, it's not relevant. The... 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 The, the pain and the confusion and the... The pain that commenced when that occurred was worse than anything I'd ever experienced. The right. psychological and, uh, you know, the psychological pain that, mm -hmm. that attended that, it attended the loss of the enlightenment, the, what was seen, what I felt was the, uh, uh, the refutation of the whole uh, non-dual aspiration the, the pain of it was terrible. It was horrible. Did you lose faith in in Gangaji, or was it more like you just your experience collapsed, and so that made you feel? Oh, well, I lost I lost faith in me. Yeah. You know, I I I had some. You know, there was a, a, an inclination to project some of that on Gangaji, mm -hmm. but but mostly I just lost faith in me. It just was yeah. like I was wrong again. I went down that road before. I've gone down that road again, and here I am in an even worse place at the end of this one than I have ever been in my life. Now, certainly in your reading, uh, you must have run across the idea that, that <coughs> awakenings can be, you know, intermittent before they eventually become permanent. I mean, that a lot of people yes, say that. Yes, but of course, the the, uh, the that rational understanding of those things is uh, secondary. 
and of no importance, has no mitigating effect whatsoever right. on, uh, on the uh, psychological and that whole, the pain. The, yeah, it's the, not much solace under the, the circumstances. Anger and right. all of that. You know, there's not, there's no solace in that. Right. Uh, there was no solace in any of that stuff. It was all revealed to me in those times to be just a false trail. Mm -hmm. But, so I was left still. Uh, now I was left without any sense that there was any hope at all, anywhere to be found. But still, with that deep desire to find a solution to this, this unsatisfactoriness of being a human being, huh. uh, a deep, deep yearning that had always been present and now was kind of uh, ripped open and, uh, and worse than it had ever been. Wow, that's a quandary. I mean, no hope, and yet <clears throat> yeah. a, yearn, a yearning to right. sort it out. And that yearning, I think, is pretty universal. It may be uh, overlooked and and uh, and and and, and uh, dampened down, you know, on most of us for most of our lives. Otherwise, we couldn't get by, right? Yeah. But I decided that <clears throat> in the in the uh, in the wake of that destruction of everything that seemed worthwhile at all, I decided that what I had to get rid of, what I what really had to happen, was not to find some new solution to the problem, but to get rid of the idea that there was any solution to the problem, mm -hmm. to get rid of this yearning, this mm -hmm. uh, this hopeless, stupid yearning for some solution to the problem. So I thought, well, if I can find some recommended thing to do and do it and get no result, no satisfactory result from it, then that'll put an end to this yearning. Huh. <coughs> well, you were already pretty disillusioned, but what you're saying is you wanted to add another layer of disillusionment and you add thought a, that would or finish a fundamental you off? Disillusionment, right. Uh -huh. I wanted to find something that made sense to me that was different from the rest of it, but that somehow was connected to the rest of it made sense to me and gave me something to do, huh. not just something to understand or to feel or to, you know, any of that, but something to do so that in the doing of it, I could prove to myself that there's nothing here at all. There's no so you, hope anywhere to be found. So fully expecting your hopes to be dashed once again, you, you sought for some new thing. And I turned, <laughs> I, and I turned to the, actually, and this is kind of strange a little bit, but I turned to uh, Ramana, mm -hmm. Maharshi. Whom you had already been reading. Who, who I had read and kind of just discarded as, uh, as too simple. I didn't know what he was about. I know he was like the, the god of uh, Gangaji and Papaji. Right, he's the grandfather but, uh, of the whole modern yeah, non-dual thing. Uh, I couldn't see much to him. I mean, who am I? What, I mean, what is that? That's nothing. So long before I ever actually got into trying to study or to actually deeply investigate what it is that Ramana was saying or suggesting to us, I dismissed it and went on to, you know, bigger things like uh, Yoga Vasistha and uh, the Upanishads and, uh, and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I came back to Ramana then because I... He among he was different than anybody else. He really was. He had no teacher. He was not spiritual. The the thing that he did, as best as he could describe it, as a sixteen year old boy, was to pretend to be dead. And yet, despite his idiosyncratic nature, he was revered as a as the as Bhagavan as God in form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> and I, I recall that story about him pretending to be dead. It was it was not sort of like you know one day he's out playing cricket and he decides oh, no. I think I'll go in and pretend to be dead. But he felt this sort of death coming upon him, did he not? And it was some sort of ego death that was starting to percolate, and no, he just no. rather than fighting it, he surrendered to it. No, it's it's actually much more uh, commonplace than that. Okay, his his father died suddenly, unexpectedly, uh -huh. at the age of forty-two the year before. Mm. 
Now, here is a 16-year-old boy, an adolescent boy, whose father has just died without warning, right. just dropped dead a year before. So that shook him up. And, and his actual account of it, well, I'm, I'm speaking from his accounts of it, mm -hmm. That had, it was that that produced in him this kind of lingering uh, uh, involvement with the idea of death. Right. And and it was in the course of that, which was not spiritual, mm -hmm. had nothing to do with ego whatsoever or anything of the kind. It was the ordinary thing that one might expect an adolescent boy whose father had died suddenly and unexpectedly to go through. Yeah. You know, uh, a really enhanced uh, uh, uncertainty about his own existence. So, and he did, what he did was he lay down because he... He, because of that fear of death, because it became so big in him, he decided to try to do something about it by pretending to be dead. Mm. He laid down. He pretended that the body was dying. He pr actually pr went to the, the extreme of pretending to, be, to have rigor mortis set in, stiffened mm -hmm. his body. He imagined the body being carried to the, to the burning, got mm -hmm. to be cremated. And, and in the aftermath of that experience, what he said was that w the only thing that remained was the force of personality. Now, this is a shocking thing for most people in the Advaita community to hear. Mm -hmm. The only thing that remained, Ramana tells us, is the force of personality. What did he mean by that? Well, that's for... <laughs> that's something for, you could find that out for yourself. <laughs> That's what my point. Yeah. But, and he went to Tiruvannamalai, and this again is his own account of things. He went to Tiruvannamalai because he couldn't figure out what had happened to him. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to know, so he went to Tiruvannamalai. He had heard of Tiruvannamalai from an uncle as a, as, a, as a place that was a, you know, place where you could do stuff like that. He went to Tiruvannamalai in order to try to find out by reading the scriptures and the texts and the, all of the sutras and the shastras to find out what had happened to him. Yeah. So w what had happened to him means <coughs> that you know this this statement that the only thing that remained was the force of personality. He had undergone a profound shift of some kind. That's right. And and, and his in his words, the only thing left after that shift was the force of personality, whatever that means exactly. Whatever that means, which is okay. an interesting conundrum. Yeah. So, and he also tells us that he stopped speaking. But not, he told people, or he indicated to people it was because of a vow of silence, but re which is called mona in the, in, the, uh, in the practices. But really, he tells us that he took no such vow, he just didn't want to talk to anybody. Right. <laughs> so he just stopped talking for 12 years. He had a close friend who would bring him books and, and so forth to, to the temple in Tiruvannamalai, so that he steeped himself in, this, uh, in these teachings. And w which certainly uh, formed the, his certainly shaped his capacity to understand what had happened to him. He he took on board that entire body of work con pertaining to what the nature of reality is and how this how this would uh, impinge upon his experiences and so forth. Finally, they, they tracked him down and, and kind of took him captive and, and built an ashram around him. All the time he was complaining, not complaining, you know, terribly, but, you know, just saying, I, I don't know what to do. I tell them I don't want this, and they do it anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I tell them not to do this, and they do it anyway. What is there to do? Now, without going into a lot more detail about Ramana's uh, uh, role and the things he did in the time that he was in the, a the ashram there, I determined that Ramana, of more than anybody else I knew, actually had tried to tell us something practical to do, not something, you know, like by getting a transmission or by, by some new transcendent arrival of the state, but give us something practical to do, which he tried to communicate 
by this whole insistence on for whom? Mm -hmm. You are full of bliss. Who? For whom is this bliss? For whom is this sorrow? For whom is this and that and the other thing? So I thought that that gave me a hint as to what I should do. I should find for whom is this? I should actually try the practice of who am I? Oh, what is the word? Who am I? Oh, who right. am I? Yes, yes, yes. Vichara. <clears throat> so so, so uh, the word vichara means <clears throat> who am I or self-inquiry, is that right? It does sort of. I mean, vichara is actually quite a, an interesting word. It means there's m several pages. If you look on the, the web for a definition of vichara, there's several pages of, of real potpourri of uh, subtle explanations. That it's used, yeah. It's used for... for uh, in ordinary life, it's used in spiritual life, but it does, and it seems to devolve down to the idea of investigation, some okay. inquiry into the nature of something. Good. All right. But trying to do that, I discovered, if if I say, "Who am I?" If I am trying to find a way to to actually do Ramana's suggestion, it turns out to be not quite so easy as it sounds when you first hear it. I mean, yeah, right, what, what, where do I look, what am I, what, where do I look? So <clears throat> Ramana gave a couple of suggestions from time to time, right, none of which proved to be very helpful to me, but I was at the time, now I'm in prison, I really, now I have no job, I was uh, actually finally, the federal prison system established a policy that no prisoner who knew anything about computers could be working on computers and and one, one thing led to another and I ended up with uh, uh, forbidden to be within 50 yards of any computer. I never did anything wrong. I, ne I was always you know just doing my job but against the rules and uh, I was ended up with I couldn't be within 50 feet of a computer and which really narrowed my job opportunities within the prison, right? Mm -hmm. So that I ended up with a job where I was uh, cleaning the uh, bathroom in the staff lounge, which took about a half hour every morning. Mm. And the rest of my time was empty of any, I could do anything I want to within the, within the confines of the rules of the prison. And so, mm -hmm. so I had a lot of time to, to fixate and get obsessed with this whole business of who am I, and I did fixated and became obsessed with it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I would, uh, I remember Ramana once said to someone, you should, and this was another thing that recommended it to me because it is so, uh, what's, the, what's the word, heretical in the, in the non-dual arena. He would say, to people, you should grab ego by the throat. You should get a hold of ego. Grab it by the throat. Hold on to it. Don't let go. And that was so out of out of uh, <coughs> so radical that I tried to do that. I would sit and I would try to find some sensation within the body that seemed to be this infantile. Um, ignorant child that uh, wanted to be wanted to have everything and I would get my attention on it and hold it tight and I would chant kind of to it, die, die, <laughs> die. Huh. And I would try other things all the time. I'm trying to look in. I'm trying to get a, a glimpse of what it is he's talking about. I'm trying to get an answer mm -hmm. to the question, who am I really? No such answer ever presented itself. I to jump ahead. But different things happened. I had different experiences. I had experiences that were quite startling and quite uh, sweet and, and so forth. And, um, and in the event, the, uh, uh, nothing happened, except that everything kind of got easier hmm. over time. I noticed that, that my relationship with my life was changing. I had no idea why that would be. I had no 
no new, uh, you know, transcendental experiences or transformational anything. I, life was life, just as it always is, but my relationship to, to it had changed dramatically. I had no, uh, where, whereas previously, and of course it's in retrospect that I am describing this, at the time it was, much of it was hidden to me, what was happening. But, it, but uh, whereas before, I would hold my ar life at arm's length. I was, you know, there was a sense of something out there that could be threatening to me, that could cause me great harm. At the same time as this yearning told me, there was something out there that could give me what I've always wanted and clear everything up once and for all. Mm -hmm. That whole relationship with life went away. And the whole sense of being distant and a, a, um, a victim of my own life went away. Mm -hmm. And things calmed down over time. And uh, eventually I was released from prison. And uh, at, when I was released from prison, I went, I was in Boulder, Colorado, and, I, and, they, and Gangaji hired me at the Gangaji Foundation so that I would have a job to come out to when I went out of prison. Kenny Johnson, by the way, is a different story, but right. But uh, so I worked for Gangaji for a while until ninety. So she, she forgave you for that affair. Oh yeah, yeah. she forgave. <laughs> she's a she's a forgiving girl. Yeah. She's, uh, and people started coming to me and wanting me to do satsang. Huh. And I didn't want to do it. I mean, I, I, I did not have a a way of um, exactly defining why it is that I didn't want to do it, but I just didn't want to do it. Uh, I, did you feel qualified? I mean, did you feel like you really had something to offer? No, I didn't. Oh, I, yeah. I, I felt like I couldn't do anything more than everybody else in this realm was doing already. Yeah, why should you add your voice if there's yeah. people like Gangaji sitting there who can maybe do it better, you know? Right, right. It's probably well, what you thought. Right. I, and, and I had lost... I actually had lost the sense that the that the what happens in the realm of satsang mm -hmm. was of any use to anybody, oh. and I had no sense because of that. It was because of that that I had no feeling that I had anything to offer anybody. I see. Okay. Didn't it make your job kind of meaningless working for Gangaji? <laughs> Yeah, but all jobs are kind of. You meaning. needed a job, yeah. I, I used to be a machinist. It was pretty meaningless. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. So, but people would want me to talk to them, and I would talk to people as best I could, and uh, always dissatisfied with uh, with the, uh, I knew that, I, that whatever it was I was trying to say, I wasn't saying, uh, using the same vernacular that was used in the non-dual teachings, and that somehow I could not say what I was trying to say using that vernacular, although I tried. Well, in uh, 99, in June of 99, I married my wife, Carla, who, who kind of saved my life in a very real way, and uh, continues to do so, I might add. Mm -hmm. And we both, and then I was fired by the Gangaji Foundation because of the economic problems that they had. Right. So now, and Carla, of course, is from Brazil. And uh, I don't know if you knew that or not, but she's from. Brazil. I knew she was from. Uh, yeah, and she speaks a lot of languages. And she's a good translator. And, uh, yeah, and and she uh, uh, she when when we married, she, you know, it was a couple of years before she got her citizenship. Now she's a citizen. But when we married, when we married, she was had a green card, and uh, we were trying to find a way to make a living when Gangaji had fired us. Right, mm. fired me anyway. She didn't work for Gangaji. We're trying to find a way to make a living. And she is, as you point out, a translator with considerable experience and breadth of, uh, of uh, proficiency in that realm. And I, since I had some familiarity with computers and the whole thing, and even a little bit with the web, uh, although not in prison, but after I got out, I, th I thought that maybe I could do something. This was at the height, at the very crest of the dot-com boom mm -hmm. so I thought maybe we should start a business 
for making websites. Net, we were not interested at all in making a living by doing satsai, you see. Right. And we, so we started a company called North Bay Webs and made a few websites for people. We started a company called Sherman Translations, which is still in existence. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carla did some magnificent translations and saved us from, uh, from hunger and uh, homelessness <laughs> more than once. But we could not possibly make enough money to support ourselves in those endeavors. It just wasn't happening. <clears throat> and people were still asking us to come and do satsang. So I went to do satsang. People wanted to hear me talk, and uh, they donated money to us, and I didn't do anything. I never deceived people. I never you know, tried to get more money from them or anything else, but the, the trickle of money that came from the donations in satsang, plus the trickle of money that came from translations and other things that we were trying to do, kept us afloat, you know, so that we could pay our bills, pay the rent, feed ourselves, and so forth, and go to the next, uh, go to the next invitation to do satsang. So we started doing satsang as pretty much our primary uh, means of making a living. And during that period of time, that period of time lasted uh, until, uh, at least until 2006, where I really didn't feel I was doing anybody any good. <laughs> and I really didn't feel like I was ever saying, I, I felt like there was something there that I really wanted to convey to people, but I was convinced that I could not do so. I tried and couldn't. People did you, heard, did you heard tell that. them those things when you did satsang? Do you say, I'm not doing yeah, any oh, good and I, I, I really I, I yes. can't say what I want to say? I'm notorious for that. Okay. Yes, actually I did. I whined and complained about it constantly. <laughs> and uh, um, so that went on. And, I, and all the time I was, I was really trying. I, I had the sense that I had something that I wanted to say, that, that there was something that that I that I could offer to people, but I couldn't find a way to to vocal to verbalize it to to make it into language that trapped as I seem to be in the vernacular of spiritual of non dual understanding and spiritual aspiration and and that whole realm of of activity, which I could see did not convey what I was trying to say, and I could see it because I could see people heard different things than what I was trying to say. So I tried, and I saw that period as a time when the responsibility I had to the people who were supporting us was to use that time as best I could to learn how to speak about what I really wanted to speak about mm -hmm. by trying to do it in conversation yeah. with them. In 2006, we went to Chicago, and on the way back from, uh, went on a trip to Chicago, and on the way back from Chicago, we stopped in Boulder, which where many of our friends still live, and and uh, people knew us and knew you know everything about us. We stopped in Boulder to do satsang, and I we uh, we did a satsang which later we called "Escape from the Spiritual Ghetto," hmm. and it was that 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 time that I felt like something had broken loose and that that there was a possibility of me actually getting to the point where I could speak about what I wanted to speak about. Hmm. In 2007, uh, it became clear to me that that that, that was going to happen. I still had no sense that I actually had, uh, had gotten to the point where I was speaking clearly and directly enough to be of use to people, except some people were helped by it. Some people could hear it, you know, underneath the the, uh, the vocabulary that I didn't know how to get rid of. And because of that, because we were convinced that we had finally shown ourselves that we actually were going to be able, in the end, to say what we wanted to say, we stopped charging fees for anything. Wow. For the first time, I felt like something was being communicated that actually was of help to people, although still encumbered by the, by the language and so forth. And I thought, 
well, I don't want to make, I want to be able to speak about this to everybody, mm -hmm. whether they can or, or are willing to or not pay to hear. So we start charging fees for retreats and, and some of the other things we used to charge fees for. That, so from, from that time, from 2007 at, from on, beginning with the 2007 retreat, the 2007 retreat, by the way, is the, is the basis for the book at, that we have out called Look at Yourself. Mm -hmm. it, that book is a very, very skillfully and carefully edited and, and, and so forth. It, it consists in, in uh, conversations that I had with people but it's very well edited, and it's not. Uh, and people have found great value in it, and w w so, which always comes as a surprise to me. <laughs> and so it was the 2000 re 2007 retreat. We do a retreat every year here in Ojai, in November. Uh -huh. The 2007 retreat finally became the book "Look at Yourself," and we continued over the next uh, several, however many years it's been since. 2007, trying to speak more clearly, trying to be more to the point, trying to get rid of the spiritual vocabulary, which which is a hindrance. It's really hard to speak about anything, to especially to just ordinary people, within that vernacular. I don't have anything against any of it. It's just I couldn't make it work. Right. It wasn't your terminology. It was just right. you, you needed terminology that sort of was I, needed fresh and, uh, yeah. I needed to speak directly from my yeah. own experience to people, not exactly, not at, you know through a, a detour. Yeah, well, that's really laudable. I mean, there's a lot of people that are good at parroting the terminology, but you wonder whether it jives with their own experience, you know. And then finally, now bringing us back to the present, I, in the retreat last year, the November of uh, 2010. Everything kind of broke loose. Hmm. All of the remaining uh, detritus of my vast spiritual understanding kind of broke loose and became uh, flotsam and jetsam, and and still circles around a little bit, but causes no trouble. So that now, and and now, what we have, the 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 state of our work now, is summed up in those two documents: the fear of life. And the um, simple act of inward looking that snuffs it out, mm -hmm. in which I set out what I am convinced is the actual cause of the misery of being human. Mm -hmm. Actual cause. <clears throat> and the second document is the way forward, in which uh, we set out the, the, our determination to find a way to bring this simple suggestion to look at you, just to look at yourself, to bring this simple suggestion to the ears of a large enough body of human beings to tip the balance from our endless rush toward insanity back to a, uh, a, a road that leads to sanity, more sanity, rather than more insanity. We don't need any more insanity. No, got enough. All right. Well, now I've read both those documents, but most of our listeners will not have, and so let's delve into what they say. Right. Uh, and, and I have a lot of questions, I think, and you've got a lot to say. So I suppose they, st you, you want to start with the first one about you know what this looking at yourself is, and then you know we can talk about the sort of implications of having it go global on a larger scale. Incidentally, um, you know you talk a lot about fear, and uh, I don't know if you've heard this, but there's a line in the Upanishads which says, certainly all fear is born of duality. I don't know the Sanskrit for it, but it, well, maybe that could be a springboard. Now, this is a really, this is a really interesting, I, I I'm, haven't heard that, but uh -huh. this is a really interesting point here, because uh -huh. actually, I hear that, and that's the truth. Yeah. That really is the truth. Mm -hmm. All suffering is born of fear, which is born of duality. Yeah. But to say that conveys something entirely different than the reality that it is that it's trying to communicate. It conveys something that says duality is the problem. What needs to happen here is to rid ourselves 
of the sense of separation, of the sense of being separate individuals in an ocean of other separate individuals and other things. That that's the problem. That 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 and that in fact that is explicitly stated in most of the uh, kind of advanced wisdom teachings to be the case that the sense of separation but then it morphs into not the sense of separation but the sense of being a separate individual is the problem mm -hmm. so that what we are seeking to do is to eliminate that sense that I am a separate individual but if I eliminate the sense that I am a separate individual then there is no one here truly to receive anything, experience anything, want anything, not want anything, be satisfied with anything, understand anything, be confused by anything, be attracted and enchanted by anything. That whole array of human experience is, is anathema. And a lot of teachers will say something just like that. You know, they'll say, well, you know, I may appear to be wanting and needing and experiencing and, you know, doing this and doing that, but there actually is no one here who, who, to whom that is happening. It's just happening without there being, uh, you know, a subject to whom it's happening. And I'm well, sure you've heard, you've heard that kind of talk, I'm sure, ad uh, infinitum. I, I probably have even regurgitated that kind of talk in the past. Yourself, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm not, understand something. Mm -hmm. I am not what the work that I'm doing here and Carla and I are doing here is not in opposition to spiritual teachers. Right. It's not we're not trying to dissuade people from their 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 love for and their involvement with spiritual teachings, ancient wisdom teachings, non dual teachings, anything of the kind. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because that's not the problem. The problem is not like it, like what I say to be the case is that we have been on the wrong trail, mm -hmm. that that uh, and that there have been a handful of people over the five six thousand years since we we as a species first started turning inward trying to find a way to make human life uh, palatable. There have been a, a a mere handful a smattering of people. There have been some, really, truly, who authentically have have uh, have uh, stumbled upon what Ramana calls the natural state, which is the state of being human. Stumbled and, upon it quite accidentally, almost. I mean, if, right, accidentally yeah. in the course of other practices and so forth yeah. and so on, and without and without knowing exactly what happened to them. Right. They just were in the midst of doing what they were doing. Maybe they were in the midst of an intense spiritual practice, maybe not, but they were in the midst of doing what they're doing, and and the the problem went away. Yeah, not well, I've interviewed I've interviewed people like that who had no prior interest in any of this, and you know woke up one morning and everything was different. I mean, you know, obviously yeah. uh, Byron Katie and Eckhart Tolle are examples of that. Yes, kind of that's right. Yeah. So not knowing, in a way that, in a, in any way exactly what had happened to them and being either at the time or subsequently as a result being involved in the ancient wisdom teachings just like Ramana the only ver ver vocabulary and vernacular that they could find which seemed to be to the point of what had happened to them was that vocabulary and vernacular of the ancient non-dual wisdom teachings present in the Upanishads and the developments from the Upanishads. Yeah. And a lot of the guys who wrote those didn't necessarily stumble upon it accidentally. They may have studied under a guru and gone through a you know, r rigorous uh, discipline, formal discipline of some sort, and arrived at some realization. Right, but once again, accidentally, not as a result of the formal spiritual disciplines. Well, not that's a whole topic of, our, of discussion. Right. I mean, but, but whether what I'm, what I'm yeah. suggesting is that, that that's as likely an explanation as the other explanation. That both of those, that both of those things, either one of those things, could be true about the origin of the Upanishads. That's all I'm saying. All I'm saying. Okay. So, for all those thousands of years, we have a handful of people who have somehow stumbled upon reality. Somehow, God knows. Yeah. 
handful and relative to the total population. Relative to the total population of uh, 106 Billions. billion people that that, that have lived, yeah. walked the face of the earth, right? Right, right. There might be a million of them still. Drop in the bucket, yeah. Drop in the bucket. And, and they are consistent in trying, it seems to me, mostly as the, as the way in which they try to be helpful to the rest of us, there is a, a desire to be helpful. There's sure, a, natural. That, that desire arise, arises from the natural uncovering of the phenomenon of compassion, mm -hmm. which is the awareness of suffering in everybody. It's not like we, we have twisted compassion into something we do or right. something we feel, but it's really just the, the constant presence of the misery of human consciousness is mm -hmm. what compassion is. And it produces the, the natural inclination to want to be helpful, to want to help people, and so forth. So in, since they did not exactly know what had happened to them, what they had done, what they have mostly done for us over these millennia is describe to us what it's like to be free of whatever it is that causes this trouble. Describe. I, I agree with that. I mean, let me just interject quickly. There's... <clears throat> There's a lot of that going on, but historically and contemporaneously. There's a lot of people just sort of describing their state and offering that that description as a prescription, presumably. Right. You, but there's also the people who've been pretty good at actually providing, you know, instructions: do this, do this, do this, and it'll, you know, kind of pr make you more. As, as Suzuki Roshi said, you know, spiritual enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. And it, yeah, you know, people there have been some pretty good instructions to make people accident prone <laughs> over the course of history. Well, perhaps so, except not so much, Rick, because the when you look at the actual numbers of the people who have benefited from that, we see that those instructions actually haven't had much widespread effect. Again, you know, relative to the total population. Relative you know. to the total population. Yeah, it's always which, been a handful who've been is, interested in this kind right, of thing, even. Right. Yeah. So. At least on this planet. So what we hear, whatever the, and and I and I am, I'm, I'm totally convinced that all of these people are are authentic, mm -hmm. and uh, sincere, and uh, and probably are themselves aware of their shortcomings in being able to be helpful to people. Yeah. But what we hear is what we should be. We should be not resisting. We should get rid of resistance. We should not be, uh, you know, uh, uh, reactive. We should not be. We should not believe our thoughts. We should. This yeah. is, these are the things that, the characteristics that we should seek in order to be free of the problem of being human. It's the man on the mountaintop describing his right. perspective from that vantage point, <laughs> shouting it down to right. people who aren't on the mountaintop. All well intended. Yeah, yeah. Right, and and it's not like, it's not like they got to choose. Oh, I can tell them something really straight and plain, or I can tell them this flowery stuff that doesn't do them any good. It's just like, just like with me, just like with me, I couldn't find any way to speak in that vernacular that said anything useful to anybody at all. But yeah. that's the only vernacular I had at my disposal. Right. Okay. So, what, what was it? What brought me on that? Well, uh, you were talking about sort of, you know, the, the s small percentage of people throughout history right. who've, who've even kind of stumbled upon this and how they, their tendency has been to describe the state they're in and of how that is of dubious value for those who would aspire to be in the same state. So, they're on the right track. And the whole thing about the thing about the, the Upanishad that you quoted about uh, the duality being the cause of the fear the, and so forth, mm -hmm. that's on the right track. Yeah. Even the idea that, the, ex that separation is the problem is on the right track. But the problem is that when we hear this business about separation, we go straight to no me. It's not, the problem is, 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 is me. It's me being a separate individual. If I were not a separate individual, everything would be right. If the whole crazy failed experiment of self-consciousness were to disappear, everything would be good. 
Well, I think the problem is the problem of separation too. But I don't think the problem is the is the actual nature of life itself, which is the arising of this parade of phenomena, this ocean of phenomena, that is uh, existence itself expressing itself. If that's a problem, we're in trouble because try that's stopping problem, that, you know? That's right. That's, if that's a problem, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> and the problem is not that I perceive that as one of a separate, of a separate thing within this ocean of separate things. Mm -hmm. That's not the problem. That's the gift. To me, that's the awakening. That the arrival of the vivid, vigorous sense of self-consciousness in the human creature mm -hmm. is the awakening. It's the awakening to this magnificent display of existence, which is impossible if I am not conscious of being, or at least have the experience of being a separate, uh, separate uh, arising within this ocean of separate arising. Yeah. So maybe let me just uh, clarify what you're saying here. Uh, are you saying that perhaps dogs, for instance, don't have a real self-conscious awareness of being a separate entity, but human uh, hu at the level of human consciousness, we've sort of individuated uh, more c consciously, and you know we are aware of our separate n nature as individuals, uh, but but that sort of leaves us in a state of fear because we're they were somehow estranged from our 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 fundamental unity with with the source of everything is does that at all go ahead not, a, not exactly okay just taking a stab at it see here. i yeah I, I think what happens is this and and i you know this i, I suppose that this i will adjust this over time you know to, to reflect a deeper understanding of what it is that i'm actually trying to say okay. but here's what i actually think happens i think that human beings are are um, uniquely self-conscious within in our in our world in our planet right? yeah there are other creatures that have degrees of this uh, sense of awareness of themselves but it's nowhere near the sharpness and uh, vividness and vigorousness that the human self-consciousness is right by virtue it's, of the sophistication and complexity of our nervous system yeah right exactly the brain and so on exactly so here we are we we are created by the biological processes, and then we spend all of our life in the womb, mm -hmm. comfortable, right. at ease, nothing happening, no cold, no hot, no no hunger, no fear, just the soothing rhythm of the mother's heartbeat, the rocking in the uh, an, uh, amniotic fluid. amniotic fluid, amniotic fluid, everything good, everything wonderful. And then, unless our mother happens to be a meth addict or something, right? right. right. Yeah. That's, that's a special, <laughs> a special sort of uh, yeah. affliction. And th th and then all of a sudden, without warning, I mean, we've been that way our whole lives. There's never been a time when we have not been just at peace and warm and happy and comfortable. And, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this explosion of. Oh, horrifying, violent, wild experience. We are expelled from the womb. God knows what that feels like, hmm. the actual expulsion yeah. itself. We're I was expelled. born by cesarean myself, so I kind of missed out on that part of it. <laughs> but there's that. We're expelled yeah. from the womb into a world of cold and hot and lights and screaming and yelling and spanking. And, yeah, all that. Spanking yeah. and cutting and you know, I mean, yeah. and it must be that in that instant that the, the automatic movement of the, the, uh, the newborn brain is shrinking. Yeah. It's contracting. It's saying, whoa, hold it. Stop. Hold all this stuff off. I'm Stop the danger. world. I want to get off. They That's right. A play it's, by that title. That's right. It could be, you know, can't be other than that for the child, for the uh -huh. infant, for the, yeah. for the newborn. Well, what I think happens is that in that instant, our point of view toward life is fixed. Hmm. As a point of view that sees life to be dangerous, threatening, uh, incomprehensible, 
and something that needs to constantly be watched. Now, what I mean by life here is the mind. The, whole, the mind is life, the endless rising and falling of uh, phenomena within the mind and thoughts and emotions and experiences and, and so forth and so on. That's life. So now, here I am, and I have to hold that whole array of stuff at arm's length. I have to keep it separate from me. I have to keep my life separate from me, lest it swallow me up. Now, of course, all of this is automatic and has no, uh, no content of, uh, you know, no what, what, verbal content to it or no. conceptual content to it, whatever. And some people but, say it takes years uh, of, you know, maturation before that separation really uh, calcifies, you know, because we're, babies are still very wide open and, and so on. But, it, you know, come all the continuous bombardment uh, of sensory input and, and learning to distinguish between themselves and the mother and uh, you know, all those Piaget developmental stages and all that. It takes a while for this for us to really get sort of anchored. Oh, in. oh yeah, but yeah. Uh, but our stance is set yeah. in a way that the apparatus of uh, We're set on that course. That's right. Our stance is set. Our stance sees life as being threatening and fearful mm -hmm. as something that has to be either conquered or defended against or Ignore. Right. That's yeah. the three things that we watch for. Mm -hmm. So, and that sense of being separate from my own life is misery itself. Mm -hmm. And all of the development that you refer to is development that seeks to explain it, understand it, get better, more skillful at handling my relationship with my mother or my relationship with the world or my relationship with my life. That all proceeds as it does. Uh, throughout the life, actually, but certainly through puberty and adolescence and, and that when it gets really crazy. But that's the problem. It seems so obvious and self-evident to me that that's the problem. The problem is separation from my life, that, that there is this gap between me and my life that requires me to see my life as unsatisfactory. Hmm. It, it's just a requirement. It's not satisfactory. There's something wrong here. Something has to be gotten. Something has to be gotten rid of. Something has to be understood. Something has to be, some understanding has to be jettisoned. Something has to be done about the content of my life or else it will always be this unsatisfactory, unsatisfying misery that it is for pretty much all of humanity. Mm -hmm. we, we evolved a number of strategies for dealing with that. Denial is probably the most common. But we do, you know, we develop a number of strategies for dealing with that. But all along, none of them erases that fundamental problem, which is the sense of separation from my own life. Hmm. That's the problem. I would uh, suggest that. Well, first of all, if you believe in reincarnation, this is something we go through over and over again. That's that's a whole topic. But then, I would suggest that that Upanishadic verse that I quoted um, pertains to. Uh, something even more fundamental, which is that there's a sort of an initial, you know, in the process of manifestation, there's a, this separation takes place between, you know, perceiver and perceived, you know, uh, self and non-self. There's a sort of a, a bifurcation, a diversification that occurs. And once that has happened, we're out in the, the world of diversity. So there's this, you know, this kind of course that we're on. And this whole awakening thing is is a matter of coming coming back to that source, and as T. S. Eliot, you know, put it, finding it for the first time. But I don't mean to put I don't mean to sort of I just want to throw that into the mix and have you comment on it in the course of your unfoldment of this. Um, it occurred to me a lot when I was thinking of your uh, listening to your audios over the past week that I just wanted to throw that point out. So I'm sorry for the interruption, but maybe oh, it's you, okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to be interrupted. So, <laughs> uh, so in other words, I'm just trying to say, you know, it it may seem metaphysical, but I think it might be helpful not to view this solely in the context of one life and what we go through in this one life. It it's sort of a there's a larger context which has to do with the very kind of manifestation of the universe. And if there weren't a diversification or a a, a, a sort of a loss of of that, you know some kind of fundamental loss of self-referral, 
there probably wouldn't be a universe uh, on some kind of cosmic scale. It, there has to be this sort of lost hide-and-seek game that, that God is playing with himself in order for manifestation to occur. Well, see, I think that's, a, that's just a, an interpretation. What's, what's the case? What is the case? How it comes down, when the, how the rubber meets the road as a right. human being. Yeah. What is the case is that the world consists in an endless array of rising and falling phenomena, separate yes. phenomena. That's our experience. That's the case. Yes. Now, the, all of the advice that's been given to us about how we should see that or understand that has done us no good. In the end, the case is that all of those approaches have failed to do the job of bringing an end to human insanity. At least, human for, at least for the whole world, they have. But for right. certain, for well, for individual participants, they may have succeeded. They may have led them on in, on a path, as I was led on a path, that eventually allowed them to stumble upon what reality is. But those understandings don't do that. Those understandings are all part of the content and are all are all uh, colored and shaped by this unseen and un, unacknowledged sense that my life is out to get me. Okay. Everything whatsoever that comes into the mind, all of the ways that we receive things, interpret them, understand them, and so forth are skewed and distorted because of the fact that they are being accessed. I, I hate to say that word. They're, they're, <laughs> it's not a verb. <laughs> <clears throat> because they because they are being being uh, perceived within a structure that is the sole purpose of which the fundamental purpose of which is to protect me against this storm of experience which itself is to my mind is not exactly I wouldn't say it's God playing jokes on us but it certainly is the energy of existence that has for what 14 billion years now been steadfastly in the direction of moving outward, of becoming more uh, separate, of becoming uh, more d distinguishable and distinct and so forth and so on. More, you know, greater detail of uh, separation and, and, and expression and, and the like. And it's certainly the case, and I, I, I see this to be true, that the evolution of the human creature has brought the human creature, and it, maybe not only this human creature, because all we have to work with is this little neck of the woods that we inhabit, but that has certainly brought the human creature to the capacity of being able to enjoy the endless display of separation that constitutes existence itself. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's so different from what you, you were just speaking of. But I just don't see that that Understanding, if it is an understanding, and it's certainly not complete. No understanding is complete. But I don't see how that understanding is of any practical use to the ordinary human beings who don't even get caught up into the spiritual realm, but just live their lives in misery day by day, lives of quiet desperation, as someone else had said, day by day until they fall into the grave. Yeah, but, it's pretty abstract and metaphysical and interesting to speculate about, but it's right. not going to help the you know, the man in the street too much. Right. He, needs, he needs something practical. Something practical and something to the point, something that can be understood and yes. something that works yes. above Good. all else. Totally agreed. Now, there's a lot of things within the spiritual practices and within the, uh, even within the psychological practices and philosophical practices, there's a lot of things that we can make good use of. But we can't make good use of them when the use we are making of them is to try to protect us or get us get rid of the fundamental problem of being human, which is the sense that my life is out to get me. Right. When, when they are put to that task to change the content of the life, like to make me understand something that I don't understand or to have an insight that I have not had or have a state of being that is unfamiliar to me, if they are operating on the content of the life, then they cannot help because the content of the life is entirely contained and our understanding of it is entirely shaped by this apparatus that has come into being to protect us from the life. Mm -hmm. Not to give us the life, but to protect us from the life. So, and what I speak of 
I, I'm going to say this before you point it out to me. What I speak of seems to be within the rubric of self-inquiry, the overall rubric within that realm of self-inquiry. Yeah. Uh, and when you say what you speak of, you're referring to your the core yes. teach, teaching yeah. that you have, which is to, to just look at yourself. That's right. It sounds like something Ramana advised or something. Right. And yeah. it's very difficult for people to, to it's spiritual people mm -hmm. have a hard time that they will hear what I say often and and quietly, silently, maybe even to themselves, interpret take it, it, yeah. interpret it as something having to do with true self or, or awareness or consciousness yeah. or you know, some such thing, right? Okay. And what you're saying is that it's not that. It's something it's different. It's not that. It's okay, not so, so let's There's make nothing it. wrong with all of that, but no. this is not it. Okay. So we want to get 100% clear on what it is you actually are saying. 100% clear on what I'm actually saying and 100% clear on what I'm not saying. Good. Let's do that. All right. I have nothing against any spiritual teacher, first of right. all. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. I don't think that anything whatsoever that has to do with the content of the life, which includes the spiritual teachings that we fall in love with, uh, everything we do in life, right? Nothing whatsoever that has anything to do with the content of the life is, is the problem. Right. And no solution is to be found by, for example, saying the spiritual teachings are the problem. If you get rid of those, you'll be okay. Yeah. Or understanding is the problem. If you get rid of that, you're okay. Right. So you're not saying either of those. No. Those things are all normal activities of human within human life that, that can be useful or not useful depending on the idiosyncratic nature of the human being that takes them up and so forth. But, yeah. but they are no different from any other domain within the human experience in which humans uh, interact and, and, uh, and try to find pleasure or satisfaction or whatever they try to find from this. Right. In other words, they have their value in their own realm of sphere of influence. They, right. Their own they Now, and it's the same with everything else. I don't think that the problem is the insane political situation in the world. I think all of these things all of them are symptoms of the actual cause of the problem, the actual problem, which is the separation from all, the sense of separation from our own life. Now, yeah, uh, that sounds good. I mean, so in other words, you're saying that all the various problems, whatever they may be, are you know ultimately could be boiled down to this one essential that's right. problem, if you want to call it that, which is separation from one's own life. Okay. And one of the one of the things that makes this insight powerful is the fact that it actually does pretty much explain everything. Mm -hmm. It really does. Yeah. So, so what to do about that? Okay, well, what, I've, what I have found, what Carl and I have discovered, and quite to our surprise, actually, I, as I tried to indicate in the beginning of this, we really didn't think there was anything going to come of any of this. We were trying to do the best we could, just like everybody else, we were doing the best we could, we were doing what came to hand and trying to do it with as li to do as little damage as we possibly could and actually try to you know get to a point where we were useful to people but i don't think either one of us ever really thought that what would that what would happen would be what has actually happened which is that we have actually discovered an astonishing actuality okay actual actuality <laughs> Astonishing thing <laughs> that I can't that I could probably come up with uh, uh, suggestions as to why it works and so forth. I have theories about it, but they're beside the point. They're they have no consequence. Right. We have discovered that, and this is now borne out by the experience of many people, to our surprise. We have discovered that if anyone so far as we can tell, will just make a, an actual, concerted, sincere effort to get the direct experience of the reality of their nature. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, and like as I say that phrase, it, it triggers a whole spiritual thing there. Yeah, immediately I think, okay, right. one's, one's, inner, one's ultimate pure consciousness, right, you know, right. that, that kind that, of thing. That's what I'm talking about. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 
because ultimately, I, you know, my upbringing right. is that's the reality of our nature, ultimately. I mean, there are many layers of more manifest aspects of our personality, but there, when you get right down to the essence of it, that's what we all are. Yeah. At least that's the way, you know, but I'm open to what, whatever it is you have to say that may differ with, from that. And what I mean when I say make an honest, just one honest, concerted effort to get the actual taste of the reality of the nature mm -hmm. is to get the actual taste of it, what it feels like to be you, mm -hmm. which is not the same thing. I'm asking everybody to see if they cannot. Not the same thing as what? As the reality of your nature. Okay. It's, it, is, it is more in keeping with Ramana's report of the first force of personality. Uh huh. So you're not speaking of the reality of one's nature in a transcendental sense. You're, no. s you're speaking of it more in terms of just nitty-gritty, visceral, right now, me. what me. it feels like to be you. To be me, right. Okay. And, and I further try to, uh, to make clear what I'm talking about by calling it by such things as the, the, the personhood of you. Right. What person feels like? What does it feel like? person. What does it feel like to be you? Now, are you alluding to something a little deeper, though, than just like, you know, I mean, the reality of what it feels like to be you when you have the flu is going to be different than what no. it feels like when no, you're healthy. No, no, or, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, what I'm are you talking about? I'm talking about you are here. Uh -huh. There's no question about that. Right. You have always been here, so far as you can tell. There has never been a time in your life when you have been absent. Never. You are here. Uh, well, Yours. unless I was asleep or something, right? Well, I mean, that's debatable. But, but when I wake up, there I am again. There you are again, right. Yeah. And, and there is, by the way, oh, even in deep sleep, there is a sense when you yeah. awake that time has passed. Right. Which indicates to me that you are there. Otherwise, yes. you would be like a fast cut in a movie. Right. Right. So... The you I speak of has always been here, mm -hmm. never absent. It feels like you. It doesn't feel like anything else. It feels like you. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't move. It doesn't change. It doesn't come and go. It's you. Yes. And I know that those terms all have been diverted into other philosophical and spiritual things. I think but, that maybe that's the same thing that they're talking about. The thing well, you're I, just using different words for it. I, I think they're talking. I think or we're similar talk, words. I think we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. But I think that it is, there is a uh, a vast separation between the abstract conceptualized idea of something that is never moving, always mm -hmm. present, unchanging, and uh, the natural devolving of that into its, uh, the thing that we were talking, you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. right? There's a vast difference between that, and I don't think that the understanding of the people who talk in those terms has, has seen the fact that what they're talking about is their own personness, yeah. their own person that what they are talking about I think because I used to talk the same way what they are talking about I think is what is the is the all is the all of the uh, acquired understandings pertaining to that experience of of you the, so that, you're saying there's a vast separation between that as a concept, which one could prattle on about endlessly, That's and right. the and the direct living That's right. and the reality experience of, of it, or reality of it now. That's you. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Well, now, I think there's a, the, whether or not there's a separation depends upon the the state of that person's experience. I think for some people it is hope, hope, totally conceptual, and for others it, it they're speaking from what they're experiencing, what they're living. Don't you think? You know, I mean, I, some, let's take I, some famous. I want to apologize for saying that I think I know what other people are saying because I really don't know what other people are saying. Uh -huh. What I know is the effect of those sayings on the people that they speak to, and right. I know from my own experience as being one of them, as well as my continuing experience with people who report back to me about these things, 
that that's the way they're received. That is the way they are received as a concept, as something that is not me, yeah. something that I have to find, something I have to understand, that has nothing whatsoever to do with me. And in fact, likelihood is the existence of the meanness of me is in the way of that. Mm -hmm. this is so, so are you saying that, for instance, somebody like Eckhart Tolle, who's a popular person, everybody knows him, everyone's read his books, um, he uh, is speaking in concepts, which is the only way we can speak. I mean, we're you and I are speaking in concepts right now, but he's speaking on the basis of a genuine realization or awakening that he has had, and he's trying to convey a sense of that to his listeners. And uh, what you're saying is, you know, you're doing more than just speaking in concepts and describing a state of some sort. You're saying, here's a nuts and bolts practical thing you can do, you know, that whoever you are, to actually, um, you know, have this become experiential rather than conceptual. Is that a fair assessment? Close. What? I, what? I, yeah. What Close I'm saying. Guy. What I'm saying is that. Uh, That, that's close enough. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that there is an act that you can perform. Yes, yes, a technique, as this it is, were. This is the a, a simple act, exactly. one mm -hmm. act. It's not like a, a conglomeration of actions and so forth and understanding of them. It's one act that yeah. anybody can perform. And what I am claiming, and I will claim it to you, mm -hmm. is that anybody who performs, who takes on the task of trying to perform this act will so far as I can tell so far, pretty much without exception, mm -hmm. rid themselves of the cause of the misery in their life. Yeah. And that one act is that just one act seeing what it is to be you. No, is, you say it better. Is to get the, a direct taste of what it feels like to be you. Right. Now, maybe I, maybe I can get it a little clearer about what I'm talking about there by by saying some of the ways in which that can be that act can be performed, okay, some, in which it can be uh, developed and performed. Yeah, good. For example, you are here. You know that, right? Yes. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. Never any question about that. Right. Never. And and it has nothing to do with the fact of your body. You could be in Gitmo somewhere and being hallucinogenic drugs and so forth and and none of this is actually happening in the venue that you think it's happening in. Mm -hmm. But so that you are certain of your existence in a way that you are certain of nothing else. You are certain of your existence in a way that you are not certain of your body, not certain of your position, not certain of your your hu human human body, human species even. You are certain that you exist in a way that you are certain of nothing else. Yeah, and that existence is sort of rock solid continuum, and and per, you know it's a despite whatever changes may be taking place. Right, but that we don't have to go there, right? No, but, but that's, that's the that's the experience. Yes, that's right. That's you. Yeah. That that certainty is you. Right. So if you get a taste of what that certainty feels like before mm -hmm. the discussion of it and so forth. Mm -hmm. You are in direct, immediate contact with the reality of your own nature. Yeah. Okay. That's one thing. The, uh, the Another thing is to just see what it feels like to be here. What is here? What does here refer to? Mm -hmm. It refers to you. So that if you seek a, the, the direct experience of here, you will find you, whether you know it's you or not. And this is the really interesting part. I'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> Another thing that I've found that quite a few people have actually reported back, we have a lot of, we have a, a forums on our website where people report the things that are happening to them, and they are just now becoming quite, uh, uh, quite active. It's only since November that I really have gone all out to try to communicate this to people because uh -huh. it's only since November that I really have rid myself of a lot of the stuff that got in the way. Okay. But one of the things that people have found useful is that if you can, and, and this is a strange thing, if you can call to mind some experience in your past, maybe in your childhood, some, some it doesn't have to be anything big or important or 
In fact, it's probably best if it's not. Just some actual memory of you doing something as a child. Like I, I call people's attention to something that was that was like that for me when I came out of a, a movie in the afternoon when I was about eight years old, out of the absorption into a, a movie called Winchester 73, into the bright sunshine of the ordinary day. I remember what it felt like then. I remember that experience. And if you could do that, you'll find that if you just look for a moment, you will see what it felt like to be you then. Not the stuff that was happening, but the actual feeling of you then. Yeah. That's the same as you now. I've actually done that. You know, even before I heard you say that, I've often done that where I've remembered something that happened decades ago, you know, and there's there's a you ness there. <laughs> yes, In, right. It's the same as it is. Which is, is the now. same you ness as now. Right. Now, the, the, uh, the, so if you do that, and it seems also that intent has a lot to do with it. That to do that with the intent of actually getting a taste of the you-ness of you is the critical element. Also, it's important to see that that taste is not the solution. It's not like, oh, now I know what I am and everything's cleared up. It's not yeah, that well at done. all. Right. That, that taste is not the solution to the problem. The problem is a sense of separation from life. Mm -hmm. But that taste will, if it's done with the intent of having that taste, will so far without fail snuff out the fear of life. Over time. It's hard to say. It, it, I mean, you're saying it sort of grows or matures happens, or something. You have to see something here, and that is that the fear of life in us as adults is not a big thing. We have, we have a lot of experience with the fact that we are not snuffed out every time we think we're going to be snuffed out. So we've become a little bit blasé about it. It's a small little murmur that isn't always even noticeable. See, it's not the fear of life that's a problem. That's a small little, you can notice it sometimes. You'll feel a little anxious or some kind of existential angst and things of that nature. But most of the, most of the time it goes unnoticed. So it's not the fear of life that's the problem, except that it is the energy that drives the problem. It is the sense of separation from life that that produced in the moment of your birth. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is to rid ourselves of that false fear. And that's done simply by looking at you. Mm -hmm. That happens. Whether it happens immediate or not immediate, I'm not, I have no way of knowing. I know that I used to tell people and still do that you should do this whenever it occurs to you to do so. You shouldn't try to make a career out of it. You shouldn't abandon all your other stuff. Just whenever it occurs to you to do so, see if you can't turn your beam of your attention inward and get a taste of what you feel like. Yeah, I've had people and, sometimes uh, say with things like this, you know, like if you're in a job where you have to make a lot of phone calls, every time you have to make one, just for a moment before you dial the phone, do that, you know, yeah, and yeah. then make your call. So, 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 or every time you brush your teeth, or every time you, you yeah. know, do some Things routine like yeah. thing, you know, yeah. build it into your schedule. Exactly. But I've since come to, and I thought so at the time, and I've since pretty much come to the conclusion that the first look is what counts, hmm. and that the first look causes, the, and people re report back how, oh, now I find myself doing it in traffic, I find myself, you know, I'll just, it only takes that. It takes it becomes a, a habit, sort tenth of. Tenth of a second. Yeah. And I think that the first look is what counts, and that it triggers that returning, that continual returning to that taste mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. You know, so, another thing I've found is that um, sometimes certain traumatic experiences or, or challenging experiences throw that into contrast more, like, you know, falling off my bicycle one time about 10 years ago, and it was kind of almost with amusement that I noticed that that, that continuum of me was just silently there while hitting my head on the pavement and skinning my arm and, and all, or, or running through a busy airport with all the noise and craziness, and yet there's that, you know, that silent foundation just kind of like not being changed or challenged right. by, by all the, cra the chaos of the airport, you know, things like that.
right. it, 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 come, it comes more it in the contrast like that I'm just yeah. sitting. Yeah, exactly. It's not maybe not so noticeable sometimes if I'm just sitting in front of my computer for hours on end doing something. Right. But when there's something a bit more contrasting, then more obvious. And another thing about it is, and first, I, I, I want to stress the intentional part. Right. It, in, it, intentional? Intention. Yeah. Yes, yes. Intention seems to be critical. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that people uh, have consistently confirmed and that is useful to know just because it might ease the mind somewhat is that you can't stay there. The actual contact with that, even it, and for some people, you might not even have a recognizable experience of having had the direct contact with the reality of your nature. You know, it's too uninteresting to attention. You, there's nothing about you that calls attention to yourself. Nothing. You don't do anything. Yeah. You don't change. You're the background of everything. Well, it's not really the purpose or function of attention to keep itself right. on that, is it? I mean, it's the purpose oh, of attention yeah. to sort of to engage in speech and eat food and, you know, what all the other things we attend to. And keep an eye on this life, lest it swallow me up. <laughs> but, I mean, that's what attention is designed to do. That's you right. Know, and exactly. that's what the senses are designed to do. Exactly. So it's an unnatural act. It really is. I say that a lot. Mm -hmm. This is an unnatural act. It's not, uh, it's not something that comes naturally, except sometimes it does. And it, you may not even know that you've accomplished it. Mm -hmm. If you keep doing it, then you've accomplished it. That's the that's the, the sense that that that's how you know that it's happened. Yeah. Now I think that the fear of life probably goes pretty quickly because mm -hmm. it's not a big thing anyway. Now it was big when it set the stage, but it's not big now. I think it probably goes pretty quickly. What takes time, which is what I'm calling the course of recovery from this disease. It's like an autoimmune disease. The, what takes time is the restructuring, the reconfiguration of the apparatus of persona, the apparatus of personality, the whole set of assumptions and understandings and relationships and so forth that have built up over your entire life. It takes time for that to reconstruct itself. Yeah. And probably also the neurophysiological component of that. Probably know? so, yeah. Oh. And that is the period, and that period can be long or short. I've known it, and some people it doesn't take very long. And some people it takes a long time and is actually fraught with quite uh, unpleasantness. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, like it can be, uh, there can be a period where the, the, The craziness gets worse. Yeah, and and I think it's just because things are deconstructing and it's yeah, uh, it's a sort of a purging taking place, right? Or, exactly, yeah, or, or reshuffling. But then, uh, whether it takes whether it takes a a day or a year or or like the I, I think my experience probably was the longest, but you know, two or three years for some. Mm -hmm. Whether no matter how long it takes, the end is certain, and in the end. What happens is quite simple: is that you just notice the fact that you're no, that you are engaged and intimately involved with your life in a way that was previously unknown and impossible. Yeah. That there actually is no gap whatsoever between you and your life. Your life being this entire magnificent display of existence that is coming and going and being understood or not understood and so forth and so on. It's not that the life then gets transcended or transformed or cleaned of all ignorance. It's that the life with all of its wonder, its wildness, its, its uh, which is the life is exactly the, the uh, endless unfolding and evolution of existence itself. The, the, the life is, is no longer threatening to you. Right. It is. It is an adventure, and a, and a wonder. It's not a threat, in any way, shape, or form. And that sounds like non-duality to me, or at least a good a good definition of it. You know, which harkens back to that Upanishad quote of certainly all fear is born of duality. I mean, if if you and your life are no longer at odds with one another, uh, 
if, if there's a, a harmony or a unity between them, then duality has been overcome and fear has been eliminated. Well, except that, that see, I and I, I don't want to be, I don't want to quibble about these things, but there's. Well, some I'm not stating that as a, as an absolute certainty. Yeah, I'm just uh, some throwing it out as a way of that saying that I think it. need to be made. Okay. Because the fact is that the sense of separation doesn't disappear. The sense of myself as a separate individual uh -huh. doesn't disappear. If it disappeared, I would be going back to sleep. The, the, to me, the desire for an elimination of the sense of me as a separate individual is a desire to return to the womb. Hmm. It's a desire to go back to sleep. Awakeness is life fully experienced. So it's not the, and whether, you know, and the whole the whole metaphysical discussion about the actual nature of existence and so forth can be taken up with great enjoyment and, and, and the like. Mm -hmm. But it's not that this looking eliminates the sense of separation. It eliminates the sense of separation of me and my life. Just that one. What about all the people who say that the sense of a separate individual has disappeared? I mean, what are they going through? What are they experiencing? Well, I think they're experiencing what I experienced during that year of enlightenment. So you think uh, they're going to lose it? Yeah, uh, it's a state. It's a stage? A state, yes. A state? So, you, so all these state. people, I mean, didn't even Ramana say that he, he didn't have... Oh, uh, no, no, he never said that. Okay. He, he well, never, ever said that. Papaji, Gangaji, any of these characters, I mean, do they talk that way? Or, uh, many people do. I'm, I don't know. I have, I, I'll tell you, to me, there's two uh, examples of, uh, of, of teachers who have gotten really, really close to reality. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, they had no particular spiritual practice and didn't have any... Uh, any real background of gaining understanding and expectations about what states would ensue as a result of success and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And one is Ramana, okay. which is obvious. And the other is Nisargadatta, mm -hmm. whose teacher died. He told him to hold on to the I am and then died. Right. And, uh, and, that, and that was it. He said, I just believe my teacher and just did it. In three That's years, right. I was done. That's right. Yeah. And I think that it's also possible for I don't know. I can't speak about other people, yeah. but I do think that here's the telling way to tell a state. If it was not here, and it is here, it's a state passing through. If there was a time when it wasn't here, and by the way, this is also straight from Papaji. Mm -hmm. If there's a time when it wasn't here, and now it is here, it's a state, and it will depart. You are never absent. That's the case. That's simply the case. So when I hear people proclaiming the fact that they have no sense of separate self, uh -huh. I, I just wish them well. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't think they're hurting anybody. I don't think they're hurting themselves. But I suspect that. Uh, well, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to wish ill on anybody. No, you're not wishing ill, but what you're saying is that it's a state and that they may have a, a, a rude awakening one day where they no longer have that sense of no, of no self, And also, a, as you, know, you did. That's right. And also, even those who have attained high states of, of uh, spiritual uh, accomplishment, mm -hmm. even those who have attained those high states of spiritual accomplishment, since they are states, and they have not gotten to the root of the problem, since that is the case, then the minds of those people are just as effective as the minds of anybody else in denying the fact that the state that previously held them in such thrall has now departed. Hmm. Well, I won't try to argue on their behalf, um, but although I imagine that a lively discussion will ensue on my site once once this is posted. Um, but um, I... You know, I just I just have a little healthy skepticism about everything, and and just because to me, just because a person, and I you know terminology is limited, but just because one has arrived at a point where there is pretty much no sense of a personal self, and it seems that everything is just going on by virtue of the gunas of nature, as the Gita puts it, um, 
and wasn't one was not always in that state of realization doesn't mean that it's necessarily a state which will come and go i mean whatever enlightenment may be uh you know aside in terms of genuine enlightenment not sort of states of experience the flashy things that we we gain and lose um you know traditionally it is something that one awakens to at some stage the buddha for instance under the bodhi tree at some point gained enlightenment and just the fact that he hadn't been in that state all the rest of the pr prior to that point doesn't mean it was a state that he then lost five years later it, it, there was a shift that took place which persisted see i think that the reports about the buddha uh -huh. when i when i read about the buddha i you know for one thing you have to understand that nothing whatsoever was written about the Buddha until 500 years after he died. Yeah, same with there Christ, is, in a couple there, hundred years. There is no contemporary accounts whatsoever about the Buddha. That's why all of the teachings within Buddhism begin with, thus have I heard. Mm -hmm. I heard from this guy right. that this is the case. And the guy before him says, I heard from this guy that this is the case. Right. It's like the old party game of, you know, you kind of whisper telephone. in somebody's ear and it goes around the, around yeah, the room right. and comes back to you d totally different. So that I, I think that just from a practical standpoint, trying to find some um, confirmation or or lack of confirmation in stories about the Buddha is uh, is not very helpful. Well, we could take contemporary stories. I mean, there are contemporary teachers who have been at it for quite a while. Um, some of whom speak in the ways we've just been alluding to. You know, having you know kind of lost the locked in sense of personal identity that once dominated their life and who seem to be cruising along and uh, it hasn't they haven't lost it again um, but you know I will add one thing which is that uh, maybe this helps to resolve the conundrum and that is that um, it, it's, at least to me it seems that there has to be at least some flavor of personal identity otherwise you couldn't function I mean, that's in, right in Sanskrit they call it lesha vidya which means faint remains of ignorance meaning there has to be some 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 greasy surface on the palm of your hand after you've thrown off the butterball that that remains to, that, that analogy is used um, otherwise you couldn't walk through the door or you, you know distinguish your, your <coughs> mouth from your forehead when you tried to eat that's right and of course to me I celebrate that it's uh -huh. not it's not the greasy leftover residue it's right. the point of the whole thing yeah that's where the joy is that's where the joy is that's yes, the point exactly. of it. that's that is the awakening mm -hmm. and and we have misunderstood but here here's the main thing about all of that is that I have no interest in dissuading people about other people's teachings or other people's states yeah I really don't I really don't think that that's of any value to anybody okay. it's of no value to me to take on Eckhart Tolle and say oh I think this about Eckhart Tolle I think that about Eckhart Tolle the truth is I have no thoughts about Eckhart Tolle that's the truth of it. I I'm just using him as a case in right, point right, for this whole thing. I don't of, think you know. about any of them anymore. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. And and so that from my from my point of view, that is all beside the point. Mm -hmm. That's just the case. Whatever the case is, we may not know what the case is, but whatever the case is, that's just the case. And the the case also is that none of that has been a very much help to anybody in the real world of being a human being. And getting from day to day as a human being that's the real case too yeah so I I have I do not ever want anybody to think that I am telling them that any other teacher is wrong or right not wrong but you just said in the last sentence that none of it has ever been of any great help but that's true that doesn't mean they're wrong that doesn't mean they're ill intended makes it that, sound like they're a waste of time though they are a waste of time but okay. <laughs> but so is uh, watching television. Yeah. You know, so is riding a bicycle. I mean, everything eats up time. And the way people choose to spend their time has nothing whatsoever to do with the, the source of their problem as a human being. Well, there may be a lot of people listening to this who are thinking right now, wait, but wait a minute, you know, I've been doing X, Y, Z, I've been doing this meditation or that practice or, you know, following this teacher, or whatever, it hasn't been a waste of my time. My life has changed so much since then. I've, I'm such a better person. I'm so much maybe, happier. Maybe, y yada, yada. I, I picked up the waste of time from your phrase. What all I right, mean sorry, is that I everything uses time. Uh, yeah. That's all we've got. 
really, that's our only asset here, is time, and it's endlessly trickling away, and we expend it on whatever we expend it on. Sure. And that's perfectly okay. And different things bear different fruits, or not. Or not, yeah, it, but that's perfectly okay, right. Uh -huh. Some things I do, like Carla, for example, has become a genius at uh, backyard gardening. Okay. And she she invests a lot of time in, in uh, taking care of the raised beds with the tomatoes and the, mm -hmm. the corn and the, I mean, it's really a, a magnificent thing that she's doing out there. Yeah. I can see it out there in my backyard here. Right? I'm sure she. I'm sure she loves it, and you like eating the tomatoes and the corn. I do indeed, and <laughs> and, that, and she's but she's expending time yep. on that, mm -hmm. and that's the fruit of that for us is the satisfaction she gets from it, and also the food we get to eat from it. Yeah, nice healthy Other food. people, other people spend their time on investigating spiritual texts and spiritual understandings and and things of that nature. I've lost all interest in it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean everybody's going to lose interest in it. Nor right? should they. I mean, people should. do what they do. Yeah, they should not do it nor not do it. I, it's just beside the point. Yeah, well, as the Gita, again, I'm quoting the Gita a lot for some reason, it says, creatures follow their own nature. What can restraint accomplish? That's right. You know the thing about the gunas and all of that? Uh -huh. That's all a quite um, a clear explication of the way things seem to be. Mm -hmm. Things just are. Yeah. They they unfold in in an ocean of cause and effect. The actual uh, particulars of which are are hidden from everything. Nobody can know how anything came to be. Yep. But that's really the case. Karma that's is the unfathomable. That's true. Yeah, it's the beauty of it. Uh huh. So, what I'm talking about here is not oh stop going to spiritual teachers or right. don't read a spiritual book. Read or whatever you want to Or read. don't meditate or don't do whatever you do. Whatever you want to do. It's, You're it's just throwing something new into the mix, which, which you feel has been missing. I'm a, yeah, I'm asking you to perform this one act. Okay. It's an act. Yeah. It's not an understanding. It's not an insight. It's an act. And How does this act of yours differ from meditation, let's say, where you, you are intentionally sitting down and turning your attention inwards? You know, How, well, how does it distinguish it from that? When you turn your when you turn your attention in, what's your purpose? To get in touch with the self, the you know, with who you are, essentially. I mean, to 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 you know, allow the the clutter that tends to overshadow yeah, that. But, to uh, but what's your what what's the purpose of that? What do you what do you get out of that? Well, ultimately, the purpose is to you know realize that in a more permanent way, and to re have your life enriched by that realization. At least that's how I would see it. Yeah. And say that doesn't make any sense to me. Why since, not? Since the fact is that you are never not aware of yourself. That's already the case. But it's a matter of degree, isn't it? I mean, sometimes that, okay, that it could just be a tiny flickering flame or it can be a roaring bonfire, depending upon how overshadowed it is or how enlivened it is. There's nothing about you that resembles a roaring bonfire. Well, metaphoric. Well, right. Well, that, but did you see the, the fact that, it re, that you resort to metaphor? Yeah. And to that metaphor is telling as to what you expect from what you're doing within and with nothing. Well, let me, let me put it this way. Let me take an example. Let's say a heroin addict. Um, you know, he's been on a course of trying to blot out his, his awareness as much as possible because life is painful to him or whatever. So he, he stays in a stupor as much as possible. Now, compare the, you know, the degree to which someone like that is, is you know, a, a aware of himself or aware of consciousness or whatever term we want to use to someone like Ramana, you know, who in whom it's wide awake and, you know, very self-aware, very self, you know, cognizant uh, in, uh, I mean, doesn't that extreme example sort of indicate that there is a whole spectrum of <coughs> gradations of, of the degree to which one is aware of oneself and that that awareness can be enhanced or heightened. And it is, isn't your sure. very teaching that you're teaching a method of, of uh, trying to accomplish just that, becoming... No. No, 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 it's not. I'm not trying to accomplish that at all. Okay. It, that is just the case. And the fact is that once the, once the looking does its work, then uh -huh. the fact that you are always aware of yourself is obvious. It doesn't have any special significance. It's just the case. It's like, it's like, the, uh, it's like the white paper that this type uh -huh. is written on. Uh -huh. Right? We read the... We pay close attention to the letters and the meaning of the words that they form, and we are deeply interested in the content of it and what it says. Yeah. Uh, but 
there could be no such thing as the meaning and content and so forth of the the black text were it not on the white paper. And we never notice the white paper. Yeah. We're always aware of it. We're not. But, but we never just it. brought our attention to it. Right. It so we don't never notice it. We're yeah. not interested in it. It's of no consequence to us. Well, it's the same with the experience of me. I am not interested in the experience of me. The mm-hmm. fact that I am aware always that the experience of me has actually done me no good in this whole life. Uh-huh. It is no significance whatsoever that I am aware of me. The fact that after the the looking has done its job and the course of recovery is finished, I am always aware of the fact that this white paper or of the of the me here yeah. has no significance either. It doesn't add or subtract anything to the text, to the to text of existence right. that's playing out on it. But it's the fear a, is gone. The suffering is gone. The fear and the and the relationship to life of separation and uh, anguish is gone. Yeah, and that's why you're so enthusiastic about promoting this because you want to help people rid themselves of that fear and anguish. Yes, I do. And, yeah. And so are I, you saying that self awareness is kind of like an on off switch rather than a rheostat? In other words, either you've, it's it's there or it's not, but it's not ever there by degrees. More of it or less of it is either it's there or it's not. On yes. off, black black and white. Yes, because because uh, and, and that's because you the and I I really I really resist using the word self because it is so contaminated. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's like but using God or something. You, <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. You. The person you are, uh, you're just here. You are what you are. You're not you going are to what be, you are. You're and not going to be more or less. That's not going to ever change. You can't be less you. You can't be more you. There's no enhancement that you can bring to you. Mm-hmm. What you can do is rid yourself of that which stands in your way of, of uh, enjoying, of being filled with the wonder and, and magnificence of this incomprehensible arising of existence. Well, I totally agree with that. And But to my mind, that which stands in the way can be just standing in the way a teeny tiny bit, or it can be a big massive <coughs> thing, the cloud that's blocking the sun. And there, and, and so, you know, as you, as you yourself said, you start this practice of uh, being aware of you, and it may take years for it to all sort of work itself out. And as that working out takes place, isn't there a sort of a progressive clarification or, or stability or something of that appreciation? Oh, sure. Of, Life yeah. gets better. Yeah. yeah. Immediately begins to get better. Right. Even though there are periods of feverishness and, uh, and confusion, life immediately begins to get better. There's no right. question about it. But and that's it, not due to the fact that you are aware of your presence here. That does not what makes life better. That's always the case already. You're that being aware is, of your presence. Right. What what is what is the the cause of that uh, growing satisfaction and contentment and saint sanity mm-hmm. is the is the the uh, closing of the gap between you and your life uh-huh. and the consequent restructuring of the apparatus by means of which you experience your life and okay. express yourself in your life. Yeah. That's what that's what the gradual thing is. Okay. The problem is the set is that gap. The gap is closed and there's no and since you have always and you can see this to be the case, you have always been aware of your presence here. There's not a moment passes that you're not aware of your presence here. You just don't notice it. It cannot be that awareness that causes the the uh, shift. It causes the change in the relationship. It is the it is the and one way of speaking about it. And I'm I wouldn't even call this a theory. I'd call it more of a hypothesis. Is that that beam of attention, the thing that by what means of which you notice things, as you pointed out, that beam of attention has come into being with a specific specific purpose. Yeah. And that is to look at things in the world as they come upon you, Mm -hmm. to identify the things that are good, to identify the things that are bad, to identify the things that you can be indifferent to, to identify the things you want, and all that, right? That's that's what that beam of attention is for. Right. Now, the fundamental uh, point of view of that beam of attention 
is the point of view that sees life to be a threat. So the fundamental purpose of that beam of attention in a life that is, that is distorted by the fear of life, the fundamental purpose is to protect you from life mm -hmm. and to look out for the things that will save you from life. When you turn it to touch that which it is actually protecting, it seems to be just like a match coming to water and the absolute absurdity of it and not in a not in a way that translates into an understanding in the conscious mind but the patent absurdity of it just does away with it huh. you've brought the thing that is trying to protect you in contact with the reality that there's no need for any protection whatsoever so uh, another verse from the Gita just came to mind, which is a little of this Dharma removes great fear. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if we, if, if we think of that, if we apply that to what you're saying, you're just saying just, you know, one little taste of this sort of 180 degree shift of attention to, you know, what it's like to be you can work wonders, can, can really remove a lot of, a lot of fear. Yes, well, and it actually seems to be pretty much uh, infallible so far. You should see some of the reports of people, and these are not reports of people who have lost uh, self-consciousness and are who are swimming in the ocean of bliss or <laughs> or uh, clarity or anything of the kind. Life yeah. is just what it is. Life is confusing, contradictory, uh, unreliable, filled with problems, filled with clarity and problems and confusion and satisfaction and dissatisfaction, life remains as it is, endlessly changing, endlessly presenting these, uh, these uh, phenomenal arisings. Mm -hmm. But your relationship is no longer predicated on the idea that it's, that it's the fact that it contains problems, the fact that it is incomprehensible, the fact that it's unreliable, the fact that it is ununderstandable and so forth and so on. You're no longer afflicted with the idea that that is a threat to you. Yeah, that's part yeah. of the. That's a feature, not a threat. Uh huh. And uh, and the yeah. I'm throwing out a lot of metaphors today, but another one comes to mind is in a in a pitch black room, even a little match that gets lit, or even <laughs> a little little candle lights up the room quite significantly. You know. And you see, I can see too, and I've seen over time, although I don't. I don't talk about it because I don't find it helpful to people. Mm -hmm. I see too how the the teachings themselves, the ancient wisdom teachings themselves, and not only those from India. You know that there was a period about 5,000 years ago when all over the world human beings began to look inward, looking for some kind of, they, what they called inward, it's really the interior, but looking for some kind of solution. You know, in Greece and in China and, and pretty much all over the world that shift occurred at the more or less the same time. But I see, to, see in all of them, all of them, that, that they resonate entirely with this that I am bringing to people. Yeah. It's really clear to me. That in, in religion also. You know, I have a, a guy who's involved with this now who has actually been through it all. He has been an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. He has uh, taken, uh, he has been a practitioner of uh, mystical Sufi uh, mystical Islamic Sufism. He has been uh, a direct uh, disciple of the Dalai Lama, uh, and uh, the whole range, a really remarkable range of experience for anybody in the search for a solution to the, the fundamental problem of the life. And he has written to me, and he just recently wrote to me, about how he sees this to be the core, the heart, of all religious and spiritual teachings whatsoever, and I think that's true. Well, and I don't I, disagree with that actually, based upon you know everything I've gleaned from listening to you both today and you know over the past week. I, in fact, I was a little puzzled a bit because it, I, on the one hand you you came, seem to be kind of saying, well, this is a breakthrough, this is a new thing. On the other hand, I I kind of kept feeling like, well, this sounds very familiar. I mean, it sounds like what they've all been saying forever. Well, it is and, a break, it is a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. But it's but that doesn't imply that we have not ever been on the right track. We have been on the right track all along, just in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. just looking for the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And 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 it it is the case that sincere and 
devoted and dedicated people throughout all of our history have found ways to, to perceive something true about the nature of reality and our relationship to it. And, and, it is, and it is, as we said in the beginning of this, there are a, s a small handful of people over the thousands of years that we've been involved in this project, there are a small handful of people who clearly have authentically stumbled upon reality, really clearly. And it's obvious not from, from the trans transmissibility of it, but from, it's obvious to me because of the, the, the way in which they speak of it. Uh, now I see to be, you know, when you see it from this side, when you yeah. see those teachings and so forth from this side, it's a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. It's just right. the case that they're talking about and trying hard to, to, to talk about it in a way that will be helpful to us. So it's not in any way that I am saying that this is a repudiation of all that's gone before. Mm -hmm. It's the fulfillment of what's gone before. Yeah, and see, it's a... It's a fresh, uh, you know, as I say, only a new seal, seed can yield a new crop. It's sort of a fresh presentation of, of uh, something that, I mean, you feel has been missing from the spiritual marketplace, so to speak, and which you're seeing in your direct experience is uh, proving to be of great value for people who give it a try. Yeah. Fair enough, and right? That's fair enough. And <laughs> even more than that, I see that to be the case so much that we have embarked upon a kind of a movement. Mm -hmm. This thing is so simple, you see. It's my, my sense, and, uh, and I have experience with this. It's not just made up. It's my sense that when someone hears it, if they can hear it cleanly, the suggestion cleanly, and, and I don't mean spiritual people. In fact, spiritual people probably have more difficulty than, you know, the Joe Sixpack on the street. Yeah. But if they can just hear this clearly enough, just one time, they can't help but try it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not hard. It's not anything they have to pay for. They don't have to become a monk. They don't have to go into years of training and rigorous uh, practice and so forth. All they have to do is look at themselves just once. Yeah. And my sense is that anybody who hears that cleanly can't help but try it. And if they try it, they will succeed. Well, and, I hope you've... I'm sorry, go ahead. And. Our intent now is to actually build a movement in which this simple suggestion can be brought to the ears of a large enough body of humanity. I've set the amount at 20%. Mm -hmm. A large enough body of humanity, just the suggestion, can be brought to the ears, just to the ears, of a large enough body of humanity to comprise a kind of critical mass yeah. that, will, that will have the effect of reversing the direction of the development of the human species from one into greater realms of insanity and perhaps extinction to return to sanity. It's not going to, it's not like overnight, but we got to reverse the direction we're going in. And that, uh, and so that's what we're doing now. Good. Well, I hope that this interview has helped on it can't even promise you an entire percentage point uh towards your goal but uh <laughs> <laughs> but it's a it'll be something in the bucket anyway yeah. um do you feel like uh, you've had an opportunity you've had adequate opportunity to explain clearly what it is you you would like people to hear or have my questions been sort of disruptive at all in, in, well your question your questions have been been uh uh the questions that people in the spiritual realm bring bring up Okay. So they are actually quite useful. Good. I just want to say one more time so uh -huh. that I do get this said. Yes, please. This doesn't take two hours to say. Right. If you will, try with all your heart, make whatever effort is necessary to try to bring the beam of your attention in direct contact with what it actually feels like to be you. Mm -hmm. Not self, not awareness, not emptiness not God, you. If you will try to do that, the, the problem that afflicts you, the problem that makes you think that there's something you need that you don't have, something that you're doing wrong, that you should be doing right, or anything of the kind, will 
without fail, go away. Beautiful. Well, I don't think it could be stated any more clearly than that. Uh, but if people need clarification, you've got a website. They can get in touch with you. You you do retreats once a year at least. And there's and I, I understand from listening to you that you're quite accessible. You know, people can phone you or Skype you or whatever. And and we uh, have we have online we have online worldwide meetings a uh, couple times a month right. on Saturdays, mm -hmm. which uh, people from all over the world join. And we have an open house most Wednesdays. I spend an hour with people who come and we have uh, You mean physically in your in Ohio? No, 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 oh. online. In, oh, okay, online. Uh, this is every Wednesday, well, not uh -huh. every Wednesday, but most Wednesdays. Uh -huh. And uh, I talk to people in private conversations uh, whenever somebody wants to and they, they make arrangements with Carla and we set up a schedule. I'll talk to anybody who wants to talk to me. Great. It's all free. Nothing you're going to be, in, you're be in trouble once we get up to 20% of the world's population, but for now, you're, <laughs> you're accessible. <laughs> and it's all free. We don't yes. charge any fees whatsoever. Right. We, we are grateful for donations, but we, we charge no fees of any kind. Good. Okay. Well, um, let's uh, conclude. I think we've been going on pretty long here, but I just, I just want to conclude by thanking you, first of all, for for this conversation. I could easily go on another hour. I'm really enjoying talking to you. Um, and uh, But, you know, there's a practical limit to how long we can make these <laughs> interviews. My, my, my wife says lunch is cold. So, um, <laughs> But anyway, I thank you very much for uh, engaging in this conversation with me and for tolerating my persnickety questions. Oh, it's a, it's a great pleasure, really, Rick. I'm really happy that we had this chance. Good. Are you gonna Are you gonna have my websites available for? Y yes, I was just gonna say that. So um, on batgap.com, I mean, for instance, a person might be listening to this on YouTube, and they or they might be listening on a podcast room. Somebody may have sent them the MP3 file or something, and so they don't. But if they, but if they go to batgap.com, they'll have a whole little thing. They'll see your photo and your bio and and links to your websites, and uh, they'll also see all the other interviews I've done and will do. They could sign up for an email newsletter, or sign up for the podcast, and, and so on and so forth. So that's all there at backgap.com. And and they can find us everything we have at riverganga.org. Riverganga.org. Right. Good. Okay. Well, thanks, John. I've been speaking with John Sherman. Um, who lives in Ojai, California, and who is a, has lived a very interesting life, and I hope continues to live one for many years to come because he's got a great gift to give to the world. Oh, thank you, Rick. Thank Bye. you. Okay.